Okay, good evening. It's great to see so many of you. I um, recognise quite a few faces and names. Um, and welcome to Advancing the Cause, Women, Doctors in War by Anne Robertson tonight. And this is our regular monthly event hosted by the Darren and Antrim branch of the Western Front Association and Public Record Office in Northern Ireland. Um, and just to advise that we've muted you all on entry, that's so that we don't get any distractions um, during the presentation. If you want to add any questions, please feel free to put them in chat and we'll come to them at the end of the session. Um, and just to advise that we are recording this session and it will go out in the Prony um, YouTube channel um, in due course. And I'll just pass you over to Ian to introduce our, our guest speaker. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much, Stephen. And welcome to everybody to the to this November meeting of the Antrim and Down branch of the, of the Western Front Association. Uh, so very pleased this evening to welcome Anne Robertson, tonight's speakers. Um, Anne is a consultant, an atheist, and has written in the past on the use of uh, anaesthetics during the First World War and by the, by the army. Uh, prior to the First World War, but tonight she's uh, speaking in a very interesting and very much on the research subject, which is with women doctors and their role during the war. So I'll hand you straight over to Anne. Well, <clears throat> hello, good evening. Um, thank you for asking me to talk this evening. I'm actually a retired consultant and aesthetist. I haven't worked for a number of years. I've been researching women doctors in World War I for quite some time. And originally I spoke only about the Scottish women's hospitals. However, I realized that there was a much larger topic that deserved to be addressed. And it has been so difficult to condense all the information I have into one talk, but eventually I've achieved this. So I hope that what you're about to hear is comprehensive, but understandable. This gentleman, Dr. James Barry, he was born in 1789 in Ireland and he was educated in medicine at the University of Edinburgh. He served as a military doctor for the most part of his career, rising eventually before retirement to Inspector General of Hospitals, which is the second highest ranked medical personnel in the British Army. He was a small man with a high pitched voice. After being forced to retire, he died at the age of 71 of dysentery. The death certificate stated that he was male, but a charwoman who attended the dead, and probably Lady Mount, said that he was definitely female and had signs of having borne a child. The truth may never be known for certain, but it is possible that in order to qualify and practice as a doctor, James Barry had concealed his sex. The name of Elizabeth Garrett Anderson as Britain's first woman doctor is relatively well known. In 1874, along with Sophia Jex Blake, who had along with five others attempted to qualify in medicine from the University of Edinburgh, opened the London School of Medicine for Women. And in 1876, an act of parliament was passed allowing women to enter the medical profession. In 1881, there were only 25 women on the medical register, but by 1911, there were 495. However, they were not readily given posts in most hospitals, though they set up their own hospitals treating women and children. If they wanted to study surgery, they had to go to Vienna or Dublin. So it's difficult enough for women to get satisfactory hospital posts, and indeed, most of them did end up treating women and children or the mentally sick. So the idea of women doctors near the field of battle was an anathema. But in 1912, they were given their first opportunity to serve in a theatre of war, thanks to this lady, Mabel Annie Sinclair Stobart. She'd been born in 1862 to a wealthy county family and developed all the attributes of a well brought up young woman. She was an excellent horsewoman, a competent pianist, 
a county tennis player, a good golfer, and a fly fisherman. Her formal education was lacking, but that didn't stop her being widely read and a talented writer herself. She was determined, self-assured, courageous, and possessed extraordinary stamina. With her first husband, Colonel Sinclair Stobart, she trekked across the Karoo in South Africa, where they established a farm. She opened a basic store there and traded with local tribesmen and the occasional white missionary and had two sons. After a number of years, they returned to England, but on the return journey to South Africa, her husband died, thus ending this part of her life. The England that she returned to in 1907 had two threads which intrigued her. Firstly, the women's suffrage movement that had started many years earlier was gathering momentum. And secondly, Europe was becoming increasingly unstable and men wondered whether they should be preparing for war. Believing that women needed to prove themselves with deeds and not words and could themselves be preparing for war, she founded the Women's Sick and Wounded Convoy Corps. She sought help to develop a curriculum which was to include first aid, nursing, cooking, both plain and camp, laundry, housewifery, signalling, morse and semaphore, driving, both horse and motor, riding, cycling, map reading and map making, life-saving in water, stretcher and ambulance work, wagon drill and fire drill. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, three years was required and largely they operated from tents near Stobart's home in Studland, Dorset. She felt that after training, she had a body of imperial, imperially trained women ready to turn their hands to any work which the nation may in emergency require of them. Nursing was not a large part of their training. In fact, she felt that the training of BADs to act as nurses was wholly inadequate. How's that? That's good. Right, okay. So when the Bulgarian war broke out in 1912, she saw the perfect opportunity to put the training of these women into active service. Britain was neutral in the war and therefore such an enterprise wasn't supported. But nevertheless, off she went to Bulgaria, where she offered her services to the Red Cross. Everything had to be transported on bullock cards and food found along the way. She found suitable buildings for a hospital at Kirk Kilis, which is in present day Turkey and close to the fighting. The hospital only lasted a few weeks, but she achieved what she set out to do, which was to prove that women without men could serve in a theater of war. Now, three women doctors went with the Corps. On the left is Alice Hutchison, who we'll hear more of later. In the center, Dr. Dorothea Tudor, who was in some way related to Lord French. And on the right, Dr. Elliot Jesse Ramsbottom. Now, Dr. Ramsbottom is seen here on her wedding day in London to a Bulgarian officer whom she had cared for known by the name of Sophocles Xenophus Panchev. And I managed to track down one of her grandsons who is a composer and one of her great grandsons who is a professional singer. The outbreak of World War I saw more opportunities and despite offering their services to the war office, they were rejected and women decided to go it alone. After returning from Bulgaria, Mrs. Stobart began attending meetings and rallies concerning women's suffrage. On the 4th of August, 1914, she attended one at the Kingsway Hall in London, the same day that Britain declared war on Germany. Immediately, Mrs. Stobart saw an opportunity. She took over rooms in St. James's Square, where she organized a women's medical corps along the lines of the Convoy Corps. Within a couple of months, the Women's Imperial Service Hospital was behind the lines at Antwerp, using the Philharmonic Hall as a hospital. They worked in Antwerp under the Belgian Red Cross with Florence Stoney as their doctor in charge. Florence Stoney had come from Ireland and she had five other women doctors working with her. They looked after badly injured Belgians and a few British, but when Antwerp came under fire, 
they had to leave in a hurry and made their escape on London buses. Their equipment was destroyed in the retreat, but Mrs. Stobart raised money and got more equipment. The unit was then asked to go by the French Red Cross to Cherbourg, where they opened a hospital at Chateau Tourneville. Now, in all these stories of women doctors in World War I, it seems that converting any building they were given into a hospital was done quickly and efficiently. After March 1915, the hospital at Tourneville was no longer required, and Florence Stoney was asked to set up an X-ray unit at the Fulham Military Hospital, where she spent the rest of the war years, the first woman doctor to be employed by the War Office. Another couple of doctors who were quick off the mark to help with the war effort were Louisa Garrett Anderson, daughter of Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, and Flora Murray. Both of them were suffragettes. Louisa and her friend Flora, originally from Dumfries, wanted to form a hospital unit using women doctors. They had experience of government departments from their efforts working for the emancipation of women. And they knew that approaching the war office would be useless. So knowing that the French were in dire need of medical help, they went to the French embassy. They sent her to the French Red Cross in London, who readily accepted the offer of a hospital comprised of women doctors and British nurses. They were to be ready by the 1st of September. Money was raised and they were called the Women's Hospital Corps. Notice they're fetching uniforms with veiled hats. Uniforms were very important to them and were designed to be practical and smart. Despite being nearly 80, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson made the journey to London to see what was going on. She said to her daughter, if you go and you succeed, you will put your cause forward a hundred years. Here in the theatre of war was an opportunity not to be missed. They were given the Hotel Claridge in Parish, which was newly built, but still full of building materials. And they turned it into a hospital in a matter of days. In the early days of the war, transportation from the front was haphazard and difficult, and men were transported to Paris by train, arriving in a terrible state. The mortality was high. This slide shows a couple of rooms in the Hotel Claridge. The one at the bottom right is the chapel, um, which was also the mortuary. The women also opened an operating theatre, and although they had probably not operated on men before, they set to work. This photo shows Dr. Flora Murray administering the anaesthetic and Dr. Marjorie Blandy ready to operate. Inadequate heating caused the hospital to close in early 1915, and the women then opened a hospital at Wimereux near Boulogne. When this was no longer required, their reputation had been sealed and they were asked to staff a military hospital at Endell Street in London. 50,000 extra beds were required in the UK and the country was desperately short of doctors. They were given an old workhouse in Endell Street, but once again worked hard to convert it into a military hospital, which operated for the rest of the war. It was staffed entirely by women doctors. <clears throat> One doctor, who offered her services to the Women's Hospital Corps was Elsie Ingalls, but she was told that they had a full consignment of women doctors. She did try the Foreign Office, but was rebuffed with that now famous line, my good lady go home and sit still. This prompted her to form the Scottish Women's Hospitals. The first assignment was given to Alice Hutchinson. She obviously had had experience of being in Bulgaria. She was an Edinburgh graduate and went with a handful of nurses. By the time she got to Calais, refugees from Belgium were pouring in, typhoid broke out, and the French doctors, desperately in need of help, asked her to stay. More doctors and nurses were requested and sent, and Calais thus saw the first serving Scottish Women's Hospital members. In December, the Claridge Hotel in Paris received two visitors, Elsie Ingalls and Frances Ivans, who were on their way to France to
to look for a suitable building to turn into a hospital. <clears throat> what they found was an ancient abbey, which was close to Soissons, so that wounded soldiers could be picked up from the railway station there and transported to Huayamon, which was far enough from the front line to not come under fire. Appointed CMO of this unit was Dr. Frances Ivans. She was from Liverpool, where she worked as a gynaecologist. Turning the abbey into a hospital was difficult. When they arrived, it had no running water or electricity, but once again, the women worked to put together a hospital, which the French thought fit to receive patients. There was plenty of room for wards, the cloisters were used as well, and they had an operating theater. The hospital functioned well. The French approved of their doctoresses and it functioned for the whole of the war. So pleased were the French with Guaymon that they asked for a hospital to be set up in Troyes. The Scottish women's hospitals were busy fundraising and the women's colleges of Girton and Newnham in Cambridge raised enough money for a unit to be named after them. It was under their CMO, Dr. Louise McElroy, from Northern Ireland. Also in the picture next to her is Isabel Emsley, whom we'll meet later on. And behind her at the left is Edith Stoney, who is the sister of Florence. She in fact wasn't a doctor, she was a physicist. She could wire a hospital and set up an x-ray unit. She was very useful, <clears throat> but she said, it doesn't matter how many degrees I've got, I will never be held in as high esteem as the doctors are. Now, the Troyes Hospital functioned well in tents, and then the unit was asked to up sticks and go to the Eastern Front. Now, when we think of the Great War, our attention is nearly always drawn to the Western Front. After all, it was where most of our troops were fighting. Now, to some extent, the expulsion of Turkey from Europe, which had happened during that Bulgarian War, left a dangerous vacuum. Serbia was keen to be independent of Austro-Hungary, hence the assassination of the Archduke, which is the bit of history that we all know uh, made the First World War happen. Bulgaria had torn free from the Turks in the First Balkan War, and they were upset to lose what we now call Macedonia to the Greeks and the Serbs in the Second Balkan War, and they were keen to regain these lands. In 1914, the first attempt of Austro-Hungary, supported by Germany to invade and overtake Serbia, was thwarted by fierce fighting, and it was unsuccessful. <clears throat> However, in October 1915, the country was invaded on two fronts, and the Serbian army, which was expecting support from the Allies, failed to prevent a complete takeover. The fighting forces of the Western Front were supported by relatively well-organized Royal Army Medical Corps doctors and nurses. But Serbia was an impoverished country and much in need of medical help. By the summer of 1915, there were four main medical organizations with units in Serbia. Firstly, the Serbian Relief Fund had been set up in September 1914 to ease the medical humanitarian crisis in Serbia. By the middle of 1915, they had sent three units out, the third of which pictured here was under Mrs. Sinclair Stobart and had only women doctors. The Scottish Women's Hospitals had sent out four units, three to the north of the country and one to the south with Alice Hutchison in charge. Elsie Ingalls herself also went out to Serbia and traveled from unit to unit. As you can see, the names of the places they visited were difficult and confusing, but as the war progressed, they became familiar to the women and to those back at home. The Berry unit, which was run by Dr. Berry, FRCS, and his doctor wife, Dr. May Dickinson Berry, were given leave of absence from the Royal Free Hospital to set up a unit in Vranka Banja in a large abandoned casino and pump room. They'd cycled in Serbia before the war and they were acquainted with the land and the people. They worked together in the Royal Free with Dr. Berry performing the surgery 
and his wife anaesthetizing and with much banter passing between them. There are also a couple of doctors who did their own thing. The women who qualified in medicine in the early years were an independent and brave group. Dr. Caroline Matthews was an Edinburgh graduate of 1908 and she spent much of her life on the continent. She worked with the Italian Red Cross and was a war correspondent during the Balkan War. In Serbia, she worked for the Serbian Red Cross with an army field unit. Dr. Elizabeth Ross from Tame, which is in the far north of Scotland, was a Glasgow graduate. She worked in Persia, but traveled to Serbia when she heard that help was needed. However, all these units had to deal with more than wounded soldiers. The Austrian soldiers who became prisoners of war in early 1915 left a terrible legacy. Here is a picture of the first Scottish Women's Hospital in Kragujevac with wounded and sick soldiers arriving by ox cart. Before they had time to think and organize, they found themselves in the middle of a typhus epidemic. Typhus was endemic in Serbia, but the conditions enjoyed by many during the early war years allowed it to proliferate. Now, typhus is a cold weather disease transmitted through the feces of infected body lice. They lay their eggs in the folds and seams of, of clothing. The feces of, of the lice make the skin itchy, and in this way, the infecting organism enters the bloodstream. It causes a fever and this characteristic rash. And the only form of treatment at the time was good nursing care. It had a high death rate. Many of the doctors and nurses became sick with typhus and Elizabeth Ross, who was working in a Serbian hospital, died. She was honored by the Serbs for her work. And even today, there is an annual commemoration of the work that she did for them. Now, James Berry went out prepared for typhus. He and his crew set up their hospital just outside a spa town, Varanka Banja. It had an abundant supply of hot water and buildings very suitable for conversion into a hospital. He erected an isolation ward where arriving patients were stripped and washed, the body louse was destroyed and not a single member of his staff fell ill with the disease, nor did any of the patients. Eventually, the Germans and Austro-Hungarians were pushed back Typhus was overcome, albeit with a horrific death rate, and the various units became much quieter. Some of the nurses and doctors felt that they were no longer required, but the Serbians knew that eventually fresh attempts at taking Serbia would happen, and they were confident that with the help of British and French troops, they would be successful. To some extent, the typhus epidemic stopped the war in its tracks. And during the late summer of 1915, there was little to do. Realizing that there was a tremendous need among the peasants living around Serbia for dispensaries, Mrs. Sinclair Stobart returned to England and raised money and recruited women doctors to work in each of them. With all these various units, there were some 600 British women doctors, nurses, VADs and orderlies working in Serbia in late summer 1915. At one time, there were 50 women doctors working in Serbia. Mrs. Stobart's unit alone had 14 of them. One of the doctors who went was Isabel Adi Tate. She was born in 1875 in Portadown and graduated from Queen's Belfast in 1899. She was in charge of the X-ray unit with the Stobart dispensaries, but she fell ill with typhoid and had to be sent back to Britain. Elsie Ingalls had been kept busy visiting her various units, and she never missed an opportunity to tell the Serbs that they needed fresh water supplies. So when they wished to honour her, they did so with a fresh water fountain at Mladanovac. However, the quiet summer of 1915 came to an abrupt end when Austro-Hungarians attacked Belgrade and then on the 12th of October the, the Bulgarians joined in on the eastern side. Serbia was under attack 
and Mrs. Stobart was asked to take part of her unit and form a flying field hospital to travel with a military unit with herself at the head. Whilst the order came to evacuate, most of the units felt that they should stay and do whatever medical care was required. Eventually, however, many realised that this was not possible and they decided to evacuate along the only route available across the mountains to Scutari in Albania. Now, the idea of the Flying Field Hospital was that they should advance as they pushed the enemy back. But that never happened. In fact, they were constantly retreating until they joined that ever-growing mass of people, including a couple of Scottish women's hospital units that trekked across the mountains in winter. This was a terrible ordeal for all concerned. Hospital units and Serbian refugees, many of whom were children, the death rate was huge. It was truly awful. There was little food, no shelter, very cold and difficult terrain. They found themselves constantly stepping over the bodies of horses and oxen, and dead men and boys were lying at the wayside. However, Mrs. Stobart, who went a slightly different route across Albania, got her unit to the sea intact. One of the more amusing details of how they coped was that they took hot water bottles with them. They would boil kettles at night and snuggle up with them in ox carts to sleep and then have enough fresh water to wash with in the morning. From Scutari, they were transported to Italy, landing there on Christmas Day. Eventually arriving in England, there was no one to greet them as none of their telegrams had arrived and on reporting to the Serbian Relief Fund Committee headquarters, she was given a severe reprimand for exceeding her instructions and taking her unit into dangerous, unnecessary risks, taking them to the front. After this, she faded from the wartime scene and turned to spirituality and mysticism. Whilst the trek was being made, Elsie Ingalls and Alice Hutchison and Lady Paget, head of a, a Serbian relief fund unit, stayed in Serbia determined to carry on working with the injured soldiers. However, they were eventually made prisoners of war, enduring a miserable winter in cramped conditions. Eventually, Lady Paget's unit, having worked tirelessly with little food to treat Bulgarian soldiers, they were repatriated via Bulgaria and Russia whilst the Scottish Women's Hospital units were taken to Vienna and then across Europe to get to Britain. The French then decided to send an expeditionary force to aid Serbia. It was to land at Salonika, uh, which is just um, marked on the map with a star and is known these days as Thessalonica. Greece was neutral and this gave them a foothold in the east with access to Serbia. The Girton and Noonan unit went with them and sailed from Marseille on the 20th of October 1915. It was a slow journey due to the presence of submarines and they arrived at the beginning of November. However, by the time the expeditionary force, along with the Girton and Noonan unit, arrived, that Serbia had been overrun by Germans. The furthest they ventured into Serbia was Gevkeli, just inside the border, and marked here with a star. Here they set up the tents that they brought with them from Troyes. They were given a silkworm factory, which they fitted out with an X-ray department, labs and a dispensary. The hospital, however, only ran for a few weeks before they were transported on trains back to Salonika. <clears throat> Once back in Salonika, they found that another Scottish women's hospital unit had arrived with their CMO and they wondered what they were all going to do. However, as we know, another casualty of war are refugees, and the French realised that numerous Serbian refugee families had arrived in Salonika. They saw a potential answer to their plight and offered them free transport to Corsica, along with one of the Scottish Women's Hospital units, where they would set up and open a hospital. This became the Corsican Hospital for Refugees and ran throughout the war years. Dr. McElroy's unit, however, remained in Salonika, where they set up a tented hospital. 
the sanitation was grossly inadequate with open drains. And if the problem in Serbia had been the cold, the problem in Salonika was the heat. Typhoid became prevalent and patients arriving from Macedonia, which is in the northern part of Greece, brought with them malaria. New offensives were planned by the Serbs to regain Serbia, and they requested a unit to accompany a regroup second army. And in late summer 1916, what was known as the American unit, as a lot of money had been raised there, headed to Ostrovo under the direction of Australian Dr. Agnes Bennett. The planned offensives to retake Serbia stalled from then until late 1918. So we should take up the story of the Eastern Front later. Now the Royal Army Medical Corps in 1916, having lost many young doctors on the Western Front, realized that they would have to enlist women doctors. All the women on the medical register were approached and many agreed to go. They went largely to Malta where soldiers had been evacuated to from the Dardanelles and Salonika. And this slide shows a woman doctor, Dr. Catherine Edwards, an Aberdeen graduate in front of the Spinola Hospital in Malta. They were, however, not given commissions Eventually, it became unsafe to transport patients to Malta due to submarine attacks on hospital ships. And five general hospitals, including women doctors, were sent to Salonika. Altogether, 82 women doctors served in this capacity. Isabel Tate, having worked at a military hospital after her spell in Serbia, volunteered to go with the RAMC. And she went to Malta in August 1916. Sadly, the typhoid that she contracted never really left her, and she died in January 1917 and is buried on Malta. The absence of military status rankled later in the war when this lady, Phoebe Chapel, an Australian who had travelled to England at her own expense to help with the war effort, was appointed honorary captain in the Royal Army Medical Corps attached to the newly formed Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. In May 1918, she was at a WAAC camp near Abbeville when a bomb exploded on a covered trench, killing eight and wounding nine. Chapel worked in the dark for hours, attending the wounded, and was awarded the Military Medal. Had she had a full commission, it would have been the Military Cross. Now, Russia was the third power, along with France and Britain, forming the Allied resistance against the Central Powers. Two Serbian divisions, consisting mainly of Slavs, served with the Russian army, but without medical aid. So once again, the Serbian government asked the Scottish Women's Hospital Committee to send a hospital, and on the 1st of September 1916, they set sail. The hospital unit under Dr Ingalls. The Serbs had specifically asked that she be in charge, but she was a reluctant leader. She went storming round the, the committee rooms in Edinburgh saying, why does it have to be me? There are plenty of other women who could do the job. Perhaps she was aware that her health was deteriorating. As the Dardanelles was close to shipping, they traveled via the Arctic Circle to land at Archangel in Russia. They then traveled by train to Odessa, and then to Romania, which had become a recent ally. Once in Romania, they had to put all their units equipment onto barges and reach their final destination by river steamer. It took 18 days before they were finally able to erect their tents. Once in Romania, they found themselves in the midst of fierce fighting for a crucial area of land. They hadn't expected that the Germans who were busy on the Western Front would be able to send eight divisions to the area. Dr. T Ingalls telegraphed for more dressings and chloroform. Out of 14,000 fighting Serbs, only 4,000 survived. The members of this unit experienced the full horrors of war and it was a miracle that none of them were killed. Eventually, they had to retreat across the Danube back inside Russia, a difficult journey on carts as many of the ambulances they brought with them had to be used for casualties. 
Elsie Ingalls, seen on the right treating a Serbian patient, continued to work tirelessly, but she was unwell. In September 1917, she collapsed and had to remain in her tent. It was October before the unit could make the arduous journey back to Archangel, and on November the 15th, they set sail for home. They arrived in Newcastle on the 25th of November. And Dr. Ingalls asked one of the other doctors to escort the unit back to Edinburgh. She died on the night of the 26th of November. She was laid in state in St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. Crowd, crowds lined the street whilst the coffin passed to Dean Cemetery. And later a memorial service was held at St. Margaret's Westminster. Now, the women of Huayamon had a relatively peaceful 1917 when this photograph was taken. But as things progressed in 1918, at the request of the French army, a camp hospital was set up at Ville Coutere, 40 miles from Huayamon and only 12 miles behind the fighting line. The beds at Huayamon were cut down from 600 to 250, and staff took it in turns to work in the two hospitals. They did a lot of the basic work of putting the hospital together themselves. They received patients directly from the casualty clearing stations. In March 1918, the work became even greater when the Germans mounted more offensives and eventually broke through the British lines. And on Monday, May the 27th, Frances Simons herself arrived with more staff. It very quickly became apparent that they would soon have to evacuate but they stayed until the last possible moment. Dr. Elizabeth Courtord was one of the older doctors to serve at Huayamon and Ville Coteret. She'd graduated with Frances Ivans and was there from the beginning, feeling that she had as much, if not more, staying power and stamina than the young doctors. The night of the 29th of May, they were exceptionally busy and amputated seven legs. Dr. Courtord gave the anaesthetics largely by the light of a candle, and when they heard the Germans overhead, they would blow the candles out and stop for a while. They were ordered to evacuate whilst operating, and at about 11 the next morning, they packed patients onto trains and ambulances that had been sent from Huayamon. They then opened more operating theatres at Huayamon and worked around the clock. They also made tip and run dashes to Ville Coudre to pick up equipment until they were forbidden. Many of the women, 23 in all at Quayamon, were awarded the Croix de Guerre largely for their work at Ville Coutere. This picture shows them wearing their medals. Dr. Ivan's in front with Elizabeth Courtauld behind her and to the right, and next to her, Lydia Henry, one of the youngest doctors. Lydia Henry was born in Aberdeenshire, but educated in Sheffield, and she managed to be on hand to, get, to catch this snapshot of Dr. Ivans trying to quietly return to Huayamon after being awarded the Légion d'Honneur. She was the first foreign woman to be given the honour, and I found the negative of this picture in the archives of Leeds University with the Lydia Henry collection. It was marked, this is an important photograph and should be preserved and enlarged. So while the war in Europe was coming to a conclusion, the war to regain Serbia took longer. As well as the Girton and Nunum unit in Salonika, two main Scottish women's hospital units were involved. Firstly, the American unit, which had headed into Ostrovo in the south, advanced further north to Vranja, where they found in this hospital pictured absolutely terrible conditions it was full to overflowing of ill and dying wounded soldiers. And influenza was raging too. They had to deal with another outbreak of typhus and the Bulgarian soldiers lay outside suffering with the disease and the people of Serbia felt they deserved to suffer. Eventually, the building was cleaned and turned into a suitable hospital where they remained until it closed in September, 1919. Agnes Bennett, suffering from ill health, had to return home to Australia, and Isabel Emsley was made head of this unit. She was young but very capable and was plucked from the Girton and Newnham unit for the job. She is one of four doctors who featured on a postage stamp, 
And this is the Order of the White Eagle of Serbia, which is a, a high honor awarded to her at the time. In March, 1918, <coughs> the Elsie Ingalls unit arrived in Salonika. And she heard they'd been in Russia and had to evacuate, arriving in Britain as Elsie Ingalls died. However, with Serbians determined to recapture Serbia, they were needed to be a field hospital which could move with advancing forces. Prior to being sent off, they were inspected at Buckingham Palace. They set up camp where they could receive wounded directly from the front line. Little by little, Serbia was retaken and the unit advanced forwards and the job was done on the 11th of November 1918, Armistice Day. A number of doctors stayed on in Serbia and it surrounds post-war. In 1918, the Gertner Noonan unit moved to new premises in Salonika and one of the wards caring for the rehabilitation of soldiers was named the Calcutta Orthopaedic Unit as money had been raised there. Louise McElroy was in charge and was asked to go to Belgrade to open an Elsie Ingalls hospital after the war had ended. This was to be made up of the three Scottish women's hospital units which were in Serbia at the time. It wasn't a terribly successful venture. I think they found it very difficult to work with the Serbs and eventually nearly all doctors left Serbia. So what happened to these women after the war? Well, a talk could be centered on almost any of them. So I've done my best just to convey how many were involved for the sake of clarity, I've omitted to mention a number who deserve to have a place in the story. Also deserving of a mention were the transport units, women capable of driving vehicles across terrible ground to retrieve injured soldiers, and they were also able to maintain the vehicles. If you think the women doctors were tough, then consider this band of drivers who wore trousers, cut their hair short, smoked, and worst of all, swore. Unfortunately, after the war, hospitals posts were still not open to women, and many went to mission hospitals abroad, or they continued to work in women's health and mental institutions. One woman who distinguished herself more than any other was Louise McElroy. She'd been born in County Antrim. She worked as an obstetrician and a gynaecologist in London and became the first medical professor first woman medical professor, eventually being created a Dane. This is the Five Sisters window in York Minster. Originally from the 13th century, it was restored in 1920 as a memorial to the women who died in World War I. Underneath are plaques, which with the names of all who died. And you can see in the medical women that there is a mention of, of Elizabeth Ross and Isabel Addy Tate's there as well, and the members of the Scottish Women's Hospitals that we've mentioned, um, including Elsie Ingalls. So it just remains for me to thank all the various colleges and universities who've allowed me to view their collections. So thank you.